People in power like to leave their marks on society, whether this is by having portraits painted, statues made, or commissioning sculptures, or even whole buildings. After Lenin and the Bolsheviks took power in Russia in 1917, the revolution caused ripples throughout all areas of society, including those of art and architecture. Lenin's plan of monumental propaganda coincided with the rise of the Russian constructivist art movement, which led to the design of one of the craziest looking and most avant-garde skyscrapers ever, the Monument to the Third International, also known as Tatman's Tower. The year's 1919, and in Russia, Vladimir Lenin is setting up the Third Communist International in Moscow. Now, the aim of the International, also known as the Communist International or Comintern, was to overthrow capitalism, no big deal, and implement a system of global communism by any and all means necessary. Spoiler alert, the Third International was dissolved in 1943 when Stalin, who had succeeded Lenin after his death in 1924, thought it prudent to err uh, on the side of diplomacy with his Western allies against the Nazis. Anywho, back in 1919, riding on a wave of revolution, Lenin implemented his plan of monumental propaganda to create sculptures, slogans, and building decorations intended to visually advertise and propagate communist ideals. The most ambitious work to be commissioned from his plan was for that of the Monument to the Third International itself. Artist, carpenter, and architect Vladimir Tatlin got the nod and started designing the tower, which would also act as the Comintern's HQ that same year. Tallinn was a graduate of the Moscow Academy of Fine Arts and in 1913 made a trip to Paris in which he was exposed to Pablo Picasso's early Cubist works and also got to see the still fairly new Eiffel Tower in all its glory. Both of these encounters would leave their mark on his future monument design. Tatlin was known for his assemblage sculpture works and dynamic corner reliefs at the time, artworks which used the spaces they were set up in as part of the piece. He was not the most obvious choice of architect for the headquarters of world communism, but certainly an interesting choice. What Tatlin came up with was a building that would symbolize the essence of revolution, both figuratively and literally. It would declare the aspirational future that communism was going to have and was also going to spread communist propaganda to the masses. On top of all of that, it would also be a working headquarters for the Comintern and its various branches. The plans for Tatlin's Tower were for a huge, ambitious, abstract structure never seen anywhere before, least of all in Soviet Russia. Imagine that the Leaning Tower of Pisa and the Eiffel Tower had a baby. Now imagine a large helter-skelter going around that. I'm not a smart man. The Monument to the Third International is simultaneously curved and straight, almost an optical illusion of arching metal and severe lines. Now take a look within the frame and you'll see the structures of a glass cube at the bottom, a pyramid above that, a cylinder above that, and a hemisphere at the very top. It all sounds pretty out there, doesn't it? Well, now imagine that these internal sections all also rotate at individual speeds to match various solar journeys. The large cube at the bottom was designed as the Comintern's lecture hall, general offices, etc. This would rotate the slowest at a rate of once per year. The pyramid above would rotate once a month and would be the home for the executive branch of the Comintern. The cylinder level would be the press bureau and would be whizzing round at a rate of once per day. The hemisphere at the top was intended to house a radio station and projectors for beaming out propaganda across the skies on cloudy days like Lenin's own communist bat signal. This would revolve once every hour. The tower was touted to be built from steel and glass and would be located in Petrograd, now St. Petersburg, which was seen as more of a portal to the rest of the world than Moscow was. The tower would lean towards the west, dominating the skyline and announcing the triumph of communism over capitalism to the western world. The steel framework of the building was to symbolize strength, hard work, and the use of modern materials. The internal rotating glass structures represented the apparent transparency of the Comintern organization, as well as symbolizing how it was all going to run like a well-oiled machine. It was technologically forward-looking too. Beaming messages across the sky was not a regular occurrence in the early 20th century or even today, and the radio station would have been broadcasting from the world's highest antenna. Now, if you're having trouble working out how all of these internal sections would, you know, fit into the structure, Tallinn designed this tower to be about 1,300 feet, that's 400 meters tall. This would have made it the tallest building in the world at the time. 
For context, the monument to the Third International would have been almost a third taller than the Eiffel Tower, which stands at 1,063 feet. It would be taller than the Empire State Building, which is 1,250 feet, and comfortably within the top tallest 40 buildings in the world. The design was so extraordinary that Russian literary theorist Viktor Shuklovsky summed it up by saying, the monument is made of iron, glass, and revolution. So, what happened to this futuristic skyscraper that was going to be the symbol of global communism? Well, not much. Tatlin made some 20-foot tall wooden models of the tower, which were displayed at parades, festivals, and political meetings all the way through to 1925, but only photographs of these original examples remain. Post-revolutionary Russia was not flush with the huge amounts of metal, money, or building skills needed to pull off such an ambitious project, and it seems that Tatlin knew this from the very beginning, designing it as more of a utopian symbol than a feasible building. He never made any very detailed architectural plans, and some of the drawings he did make differed quite significantly to the physical models produced. The avant-garde style was only really popular during a small window in Soviet history, and as is the case with all art forms, opinion was split. Critics of the monument included Leon Trotsky, who probably fairly called it impractical and romantic. But you know what, Trotsky? You could pretty much say the same thing about the whole idea of global communism. <laughs> The tower did find fans in the future, though, although Tatlin's wooden prototypes were lost in the 1920s, a reconstruction was made in the late 1960s under the supervision of Pontus Halton, a museum director in Sweden. He went on to be the first director of the Pompidou Centre in Paris, where he commissioned another reproduction to be put on display there. There are a couple of other models that travel around the world, and in 2007, artist Ai Weiwei created Working Progress Fountain of Light, an illuminated version of the monument that floated in the Royal Albert Dock outside the Tate Liverpool Gallery. The tower was also immortalized on a Russian postage stamp in the year 2000. Although he is labeled as one of the founders of the constructivist art movement, Tallinn didn't really like the label as he disagreed with the ethos of design for propaganda coming at the cost of artistic expression. Looking back, the non-traditional and somewhat radical artist seems like a rather strange choice to have been picked to design Communist HQ. This was his first architectural project, and he dropped out of the limelight in the 1930s when his preferred modernism gave way to the socialist realism movement. Tallinn then went on to be criticized in the 1940s for allegedly anti-communist views. Nevertheless, even as just an architectural model, Tallinn's design for the monument, or tower, is held up as a prime example of Russian constructivism, using traditional construction materials and having an abstract as well as an industrial aesthetic. Even though it was never built, it remains in the cultural memory as it perfectly captured the zeitgeist of the Bolshevik Revolution. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. Please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.